we're talking about the kingdoms of God and the kingdoms of men still. We're going to talk about that until Jesus comes back. So just get used to it. Um, Because that's pretty much all that Jesus preached, right? The kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is at hand. It is here already. Thank you. Okay. Um, But one thing that I've that the Lord has put on my heart um, is to explain what the the kingdom of darkness is doing in this day so that we know not to get duped into all of this nonsense that goes on in our world that's just a huge distraction. So if you'll actually go to the next slide, this is what I want to talk about. I want to talk about disappointments, I want to talk about distraction, I want to talk about doubt, disturbance, and division. Um, I say that this is what the enemy is doing in this season, but this is all he's been doing ever since the beginning of time. Um, It's just the same thing, it's just the same cycle. He doesn't have new tricks. Once you... Once you catch him in one, you catch him in all of them. So, uh, I have a lot of scripture that I want to read through, but I just want what what I feel like the Lord wants to do is break dis- discouragement and disappointment off of your life. Disappointment is the enemy of faith. If you embrace disappointment... You are embracing a lie. Because we do not have a God that disappoints. You may misunderstand what he's doing. But when you know, when the goodness of God is your foundation, that every single thing he does is good, then you eradicate disappointment from your life. So I want to look at Matthew 14, 1 through 21 first. Um, So you'll have to pull out your Bible phones. And um, because I'm not going to have it up on the screen because I have so much scripture. It would have taken me, you know, all week just to put it on the slides. So um, Matthew 14, 1 through 21. everyone there? First one there, stand up and read it. No, I'm joking. Um, all right. At the time, so this is, this is the beheading of John the Baptist. Um, and I want to show you how Jesus responds to this act of injustice. At the time, Herod, the Tetrarch, heard about the fame of Jesus And he said to his servants, this is John the Baptist. He has been raised from the dead. So he's talking about Jesus. He's saying Jesus is John the Baptist raised from the dead. And he's saying it before he beheads John the Baptist. So he's already confused a little bit. Um, (laughs) He said that is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. Herod had seized John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias. His brother, Philip's wife, his brother, Philip's wife, because John had been saying to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. And though he wanted to put him to death, he feared the people because they held him. Sorry, Siri's trying to listen to me. Um, And they wanted to put him to death. And he feared the people because they had held him to be a prophet. But when Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias danced before the company and pleased Herod so that he promised that with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. Prompted by her mother, she said, give me the head of John the Baptist here on a platter. And the king was sorry. But because of his oath and his guests, he commanded it to be given. He sent and had John beheaded in the prison, and his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl, and she brought it to her mother. 
And his disciples came and took the body and buried it. And when and they went and told Jesus. Okay, so they bury his body. They go and inform Jesus that his cousin, the greatest prophet up to that point, because Jesus said, even the least in the kingdom is greater than John the Baptist. But at this point, he declared John the Baptist was the most important prophet in all of history because of what he was prophesying. He was bringing the now word of the kingdom of God coming and the Son of Man and the Son of God coming. So he's being informed of one of the greatest relationships that he has in his life. They, I mean, they, it doesn't seem like they spent a whole lot of time together, but spiritually... It was one of his greatest relationships that he has. And they send word that the king just cut his head off. And look how he responds. It says, now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. Notice it doesn't say that he gets a bunch of protesters together to come declare this horrible act of injustice that a kingdom of man had done upon him and his people. He withdrew to be with the Father. That's the first response to every single act of injustice, every single wrong that is ever done to us. We respond by going away and being alone with the Father. Because until you do that, you're not going to respond right. Ever. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. He went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, and healed their sick. All right, now you might say, well, wasn't he supposed to get away and be alone with the Father? Well, he only did what he saw the Father doing, and he only said what he heard the Father saying. Now, when Jesus begins to feel compassion on people, that is what the Father's doing. You can know that the Father is moving on your life through compassion. If you begin to feel compassion for someone, that means God is feeling compassion for them. It's God's compassion that he's given you. It's God's heart that he's given you. So when Jesus, his first, he understood that the right way to respond to this horrible act of injustice was to get alone with the Father, but the Father redirects him by causing him to be compassionate toward the crowd that wouldn't leave him alone. So if you notice, Jesus doesn't get a bunch of protesters together and then goes and protests against Herod. He just got away, and the crowd followed him. (laughs) They wanted to know what Jesus was doing. Now, why in today, in our society, when bad things happen, why isn't the first thing that the crowd is saying is, well, where's Jesus going? What is Jesus doing? I heard he does miracles. How's the church responding? I heard they can perform miracles. (laughs) I haven't heard that once. Something to think about. It says, but when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Now when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place, and the day is over now. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. They said to him, we only have five loaves and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and two fish. He looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. The disciples gave them to the crowds, and they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up twelve baskets full of the broken pieces left over. And those who ate were about five thousand men, besides women and children. So this is the justice of God. When you read in the Bible 
and you see that God is a just God, this is how he performs his justice. See, we think that justice is revenge and people getting what they deserve. That's the kingdoms of men. In the kingdom of God, God finds out who has been acted against unjustly and he redeems their situation. Period. That's justice. That is our new covenant justice because of the blood of Jesus. So, the reason I put it in this order, I put it in this order, disappointment equals distraction. Jesus could have easily been disappointed in this moment, obviously. And he could have let, I mean, he, he felt disappointment. I'm not saying Jesus didn't feel disappointment. Jesus felt every single emotion we felt. He felt every single temptation we felt. And he certainly felt the cross, which I have never felt. <laughs> and just because he felt it doesn't mean he acted on it. Like Jesus had this way of being able to take every single human emotion, understand that it's a valid emotion, but not let it be in charge of his spirit. We are body, soul, and spirit. They all equally exist within us, but they are not all equally important. Your spirit is what's most important, and then your soul, and then your body. And you have to take care of it in that way. That means that even when an injustice or something is being done to your body, like sickness or cancer, cancer is an injustice that is put upon you from the curse of sin. The curse of sin has been broken by the cross of Jesus. So sickness didn't used to be unjust. But now that Jesus has broken the curse of sin, sickness, and poverty. When you experience it now, it's not Jesus anymore. It's the enemy. Trying to implement a curse that has already been taken care of and broken. So. What does that mean that. How are you supposed to respond to the act of injustice that's been done to you? Let's say you have cancer. And let's say that the enemy has done an act of injustice against you by giving you cancer or by influencing you in some way to where it produces cancer. Then how would God respond justly? Through you. He'd tell you to go pray for the sick. You see, John the Baptist got his head chopped off, and Jesus went and fed people. John couldn't eat anymore. <laughs> Sorry, it was a bad joke. Are you guys getting what I'm saying? Are you seeing that the kingdom of God operates completely opposite than how we inherently think Justice is supposed to be, or how the kingdom is supposed to respond. And it's an upside down kingdom. Everything's backwards. Every, it's like when you're, when you're not being led by the Spirit and someone's trying to teach you about the kingdom of God, it's like walking into one of those mirror mazes or like a fun house and like everything's like spinning. And you're like, this doesn't make any sense. How do you live in this place? And we're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> we love it here. It's fun. <laughs> it's a fun house. Anyway. Um, I want to read another scripture um, in John 11. It says, Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with, oil, with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sister sent to him saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. 
So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. That didn't make any sense. Now Jesus loved Mary and her sister and Lazarus, so he stayed two more days. Which means he was probably trying... How many of you know he could have just healed Lazarus, but he loved Mary and Martha too? (laughs) And there were things in Mary and Martha that still need to be dealt with. Lazarus, yeah, he he needed to be dealt with because he was dead. But Mary and Martha weren't dead, and they still need to be dealt with. When I say dealt with, I mean like dealt a good hand of the love of Jesus. (laughs) Through correction. (laughs) Then, after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought he meant taking rest in sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died, and for your sake, I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. So Thomas, called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she wept and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Disappointment right there. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. So she responds to her, dif- her disappointment with her religious saying. Like her good, the, what the good Christian thing would be to do. I, she wasn't a Christian, but you get what I'm talking about, right? If you hadn't been here, he wouldn't have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. So, you know, you guys know the song, uh, um, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. I imagine she knew that song. And (laughs) what I mean by that is, if that's the only song that your soul sings to Jesus, then you will always expect that all of your disappointments and all these horrible things that have ever happened to you will be taken care of, but they're not going to be taken care of until you go home to glory, right? So we, I mean, I'm not saying that's not a true song. I mean, the song's true. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. We'll sing and shout the victory, but Jesus here is singing and shouting the victory currently right now, and you're singing a song about singing the shout of victory later. (laughs) And this is how Martha responds. It's like the, she thinks it's the right way to respond in her disappointment. Well, Jesus isn't disappointed that Jesus, that Lazarus died. Because he knows what's going to, he knows what's coming. He, the Lord's already informing him. The Holy Spirit, he's already receiving prophetically what The Lord is going to do when he gets there. So he's not operating in disappointment. That's why the prophetic ministry is so important. So that you don't walk in disappointment. So that you're edified, encouraged, and comforted. No matter what you're experiencing now. Because you know that God promised something else. Right? And then even if that something else doesn't come to pass. 
you don't then just remain in disappointment and say, oh, well, you know, they must have just had a bad word or, you know, maybe God just changed his mind or something. You start, do you see what disappointment does to your theology? It starts to like twist it. So disappointment equals distraction. Distraction causes you to doubt. Doubt allows the enemy to come in and cause a disturbance or a, dis- a, a deception. All of these are forms of deception, but that disturbance piece is where he finally comes in and says, here's your new way of thinking. Here's your new theology that's going to fit your experience instead of fit the word of God. And then that disturbance will ultimately bring division. It will divide you from God, or at least it will divide you from hearing from God. Now, nothing can pluck you out of his hand, but that doesn't mean that you, I mean, you can still just walk blindly through life and then end up in heaven because you prayed the prayer. (laughs) Um, And then it also will come in and bring division among people. Disappointment has been the root of more church splits than I think anything else. We would say, well, no, usually it's theology. Well, but again, people made new theology based on their disappointments. (laughs) So-and-so didn't get healed. God must not heal anymore. Or, oh, that was just the thorn. It's just the thorn in my flesh, you know. Cancer's just the thorn in my flesh, just like Paul. Well, that wasn't the context that Paul was talking about. Paul was talking about people arguing with him and his theology. And if you look in the Old Testament, there's two points where it talks about a thorn in your flesh. And it's referring to people arguing about theology. (laughs) So, if you ever wondered what that meant, all he was doing was referring to the Old Testament. So you can't use that as as an excuse to let sickness create disappointment in your life. So Jesus says to her, I'm the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ the Son of God, who is coming into the world. So she's still (laughs) missing the point. Oh yeah, I know you're God that's going to come later, even though you're standing right in front of me. But I know that you're going to come again in the future. You know, maybe she believed in the rapture already. I don't know. Um, Sorry, anyway, bad theology joke. Um, So, yes, Lord, I believe that you're the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but he was still in the place where Martha had met him. So he wasn't in a hurry. Remember earlier I said God's not in a hurry? (laughs) He's still in the same place. When the Jews who were with her in the house consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out. They followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now I want you to notice something. She said the same exact thing Martha said. But she said it in a completely different spirit than what Martha said had said it. And Martha came with this weird theology, religious mindset, and performance mentality, because we know, you know, she was making sandwiches in in the kitchen for Jesus, sandwiches that he didn't ask for. And, uh, and Mary was pouring oil out on his feet. Or no, no, I'm sorry. Mary was sitting at his feet listening. The other Mary poured oil out. She sat at his feet and was listening, resting in his presence, wanting to hear every single word that he had to say. Because it wasn't time to make sandwiches. It was time to hear what Jesus was saying. It wasn't time to do the dishes. I give every single person permission to let your dishes just pile up in your kitchen 
while you sit at the feet of Jesus. Okay? Amen? All right. All the Marthas in the room are like, please stop talking right now. Because that means I'm going to be the one who has to do them. I have to get them done. If I don't do them, who else is going to do them? Mike, is anyone being convicted currently? Tara? Well, now I'm convicted because we do the dishes equally, I think. Of course, she, she accumulates more dirty dishes because of all the baking she does, but then we each equally do the dishes. So who's actually doing more of somebody else's dishes? <laughs> but, you know, I don't have to breastfeed a baby, so I guess it all just comes out in the wash. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, Lord. <laughs> Where was I? Yeah, I'm trying to find it. I don't even know what page I'm on anymore. Now, when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. So the Jews said, See how he loved him? Jesus, Jesus wept. So that's the shortest verse in the entire Bible, and yet it's one of the most important verses in the Bible because it teaches us that even though we know what the outcome is, we can still weep with people. Because if you don't weep with someone, you don't get the right to rejoice with them. If you don't weep with people, you don't get the right to rejoice with them. So Jesus... You know, Martha came with the wrong motive. She came with this distraction motive. And she's all flustered and frazzled and freaked out. <laughs> and Jesus couldn't respond to that because he knew that wasn't a proper heart response for grief and for pain. Like, you have to meet your grief head on. Have you ever heard... The term where it's like you can't go under your grief, you can't go around your grief, and you can't go over it, you have to go through it. It's a, that's true, it's not in the Bible, but it's true. <laughs> and so the Lord sees, Jesus sees the difference between someone that's not dealing with their grief properly and someone who is, and his heart responded with compassion to the one that was properly responding to their grief. Because if you're not properly responding to your grief, it doesn't matter what Jesus is going to say to you anyway, because you got walls up. And she had all these religious theology weird walls that she had put up, and she wouldn't have been able to hear what Jesus was saying. In fact, he tried to say it to her, and she still didn't get it. But Mary comes and weeps, and then she gets to experience one of the most powerful moments in the Gospels, where the Son of the living God weeps with her, over her situation and her pain. So remember, Jesus had to deal with Lazarus. He had to deal with Martha. And he had to deal with Mary. And somehow, in his messianess and all-knowing wisdom, he knew how to, because you know he's only doing what the Father is telling him to do. So the father's seeing the situation and knows how to heal every single heart. The dead heart, the dead heart, the dead heart, the hard heart, and the hurt heart. <laughs> and so Jesus, in weeping with Mary, is healing her heart. Martha, I'm not sure if she ever received it, or if her performance mentality constantly caused her to miss what it was that Jesus was saying. And then Lazarus, he didn't have to do anything but wait. <laughs> Just chill out for a few days, get some rest. 
Try not to stink up the place. <laughs> oh, let it rain, Lord. Pour out your spirit in this place. Thank you. I keep getting lost. I'm sorry. That's why I'm still making jokes, because I'm trying to find where my spot was. Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone laid against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you would always, I, I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth, Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Now this part's really interesting. I want you to keep focusing on this, like these steps that people take in order to reach division, Okay? So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, What are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it is better for one, for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. He did not say this of his own accord, accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. It, this is so interesting. So Caiaphas is the high priest, and he receives a prophetic word about Jesus dying for all the people. So he decides to put him to death. It's so backwards, like everything just doesn't make sense in that. Until I, I, I was writing this down, and then I was looking at the story of Mary and Martha and Jesus weeping at the tomb, and I got to this, and I'm like, oh my goodness, that happened to Caiaphas. You see, Caiaphas was disappointed in who Jesus was. All of, most of the Pharisees were disappointed. Because they were expecting something totally different. They were expecting one of them, probably. You know? But what did they get? They got Jesus, born in a manger, a carpenter. Does anything good come from Galilee? Nazareth? <laughs> Wrong one. I mean, came from both, but anyway. Um, <laughs> and so, he gets disappointed. And this leads to this distraction. Now, when you're working with prophetic ministry... If you're receiving prophetic words from God and you're already disappointed in how he's doing it, then you're not going to see the full picture. I mean, it's hard enough to see the full picture anyway because we see through a glass dimly. But we don't need to like add more panes of glass on it. A pane of, of distraction. Another pane of glass of disappointment and doubt and bitterness and unforgiveness. Well, now you can't even... You don't even know there's an outside world. <laughs> so he's disappointed in how God was sending his Messiah and who it was. And he starts to get distracted and he starts 
to doubt, and then the enemy can come in and bring a disturbance, and it creates division. And now, what do we see? We see an entire group of Jews yelling, crucify him, when just a few days before, they were shouting Hosanna and waving their palm branches. Because this one man who received a genuine prophetic word from the Lord, I mean, he was right, but where was he getting this word from? Was he getting it from the second heaven or the third heaven? So the, sec- so the Bible, for those of you I just completely lost, um, the Bible talks about a first heaven, a second heaven, and a third heaven. The reason I know that is because the Bible says, well, Paul said, I knew a man, and he was talking about himself. Or I guess he was trying to be humble or something. Um, and he said, I knew a man who went to the third heaven. He said it because he didn't want to boast in in himself. And there he saw marvelous things that he couldn't even speak about. So the third heaven is where God's glory realm is. Right? That is the presence of God. That is where Satan was removed from. And then, how many of you know that you can assume if there's a third heaven... There's probably a first and a second, right? <laughs> you know, uh, anyway, I'm not going to say that. Um, so, the second heaven, the first heaven refers to actually this realm, like our physical realm. God created the heavens and the earth, right? That is the physical realm. That is the first heaven that he's talking about. But then... There is this in-between place that is the second heaven. And this is where principalities and powers were positioned to rule and reign over the earth. And over different parts and elements of the earth, if you will. Right? There's territorial spirits. There's spirits that, that control the element. Now, some of you are definitely getting totally lost now. There's spirits that control the elements. How I many of you know God, Jesus Christ? calmed the storm, he rebuked the storm. That was a principality that was there to govern weather. But it was a fallen principality that was trying to bring a disturbance in the will of God through Jesus, you know, traveling on a boat. There's territorial spirits. You know, the angel that was positioned in the garden, he was there to guard a territory. That It's just a geographical location that he's guarding. I don't know if he's still there or not. I don't know if something happened when Jesus died on the cross. But either way, I'm not going to go searching for it. Um, So there's territorial spirits. There's spirits that were intended. God. This is how God created the systems, the kingdom of heaven and the kingdoms of man. He, He positioned this second realm, if you will. The heavens are just spiritual realms, right? And this second realm is where these angels and now demons dwell. So when Adam was having an experience, or when Eve was having that experience with Satan, she was having a second heaven experience. Does that make sense? So that's where all of their plans and schemes are all figured out, and then they try to implement them on us here in the first heaven. But we're seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. So that means that we, as spirit beings, are seated in all three heavens. Are you with me? Three of you. Great. Um, Where was I going with this? Yeah, that's right. So he's receiving this word from this place that's not fully the throne room, right? So it's getting, there's some truths to it, there's some not true to it. This is why you don't, you don't have to be right, you don't have to be wrong to be a false prophet. You just have to be operating out of the wrong realm. And, and not operating in love. Like that, Those are basically the two things that cause you to be a false prophet. Either you didn't operate in love, or you operated out, out of the wrong realm. But that doesn't mean that you can't be wrong, because we see through glass dimly. And why would Paul give instructions for people to judge prophecy in a healthy way if it wasn't possible for prophets who are 
true prophets of the Lord to be wrong. I mean, how many of you have been wrong before? False prophets. No. Um, <laughs> so Caiaphas, because of his disappointment, he couldn't see what was true and what wasn't. So he gets this truth. He gets kind of a game plan of what's going to take place. It is better that Jesus dies for the nation. But he was thinking of it in a different way. He was thinking of it in more of a first heaven sort of way. Like it's better that we just give him over so that the Romans don't come. But how many of you know it's actually better that Jesus was given over so that the demons don't come? (laughs) You see what I'm saying? So that we can then be positioned in heavenly places so that we can know the true plans of God and not get caught up in the second heaven scheme of the enemy. See, so many people, they they hear prophecies or they receive something, they start to see something that is the plan of the enemy and then they say that it's prophecy, that it's God. They didn't know to discern to discern the spirit that gave them that word. So when Satan fell, he took a third of the angels with him, and every single one of those angels had a job. They had something that they were supposed to govern over. They weren't just flying around blown bubblegum bubbles. <laughs> they, were, they had assignments. Some of them were supposed to be Governing over Asia. Some of them are supposed to be governing governing over weather. Some of them are supposed to be governing over America. Over finances. Over the leaders of, of these places. Over you and me. Over our food. Over our crops. Any area of, of society that is important to people. They were there to help govern over them. And make sure that they operated properly. In this system that God created. So for instance. When Jesus casts out. Legion. Legion says to him. Don't send us away from this place. Because they were a territorial spirit. They only had power in that place. Because that was what they were created to govern over. Right? Like, let's say you're a carpenter and I took all your tools away and I gave you a gardening hoe (laughs) and said, go do your carpentry job. So that's what Jesus does in this moment. He sees Legion is here to govern over this area and he's not allowed to govern anywhere else. He doesn't have the impartation he wasn't created to govern anywhere else so legion is is begging that they don't get sent away because they know if they get sent away they will no longer have power and so they say well at least send us into the pigs and jesus says okay i'll send you into the pigs knowing that the pigs are just going to go crazy and commit suicide into the sea well they weren't there to govern the sea are you guys making this connection So, a spirit of poverty was originally created to bring prosperity, and then it fell from heaven, and now all it wants to do is is twist and pervert the assignment that it was given because it's been separated from the presence of God. It's been disappointed, distracted, it became in doubt, it gets disturbed, and then it comes and creates division. That's the second heaven scheme. But there are two-thirds angels to our one-third demons. So every single area in your life that something is trying to govern over that maybe you need to remove it from its place of power can be replaced by at least two angels that are operating out of the third heaven, the presence of God. So when you... Get an assignment from God. Let's say God wants you to pray against abortion. Right? I see so many people 
you know, they'll, they'll go outside Planned Parenthood, they'll hold up signs, and they'll try to get people to not go in and kill their babies. How many of you know that's a wonderful thing? I'm not saying not to do that. But if you notice, their backs are to Planned Parenthood, and their signs are to the road. Now, there's something governing behind them. What if they just turned around and told the thing that it had to leave, told Planned Parenthood that it had to shut down? Like, you will close your doors in the next 30 days in the name of Jesus. Like, what if you just did that? And you went back for the next 30 days and reminded it. (laughs) Said, hey, remember I gave you that order that I'm allowed to give because I'm in the third heaven and you're only in the second heaven. (laughs) And then they get all worked up and then they get angry and then then there will be a wave of abortions and you'll be like, oh no, this must not be working because it's just trying to cause disappointment, distraction, doubt. It's trying to disturb you and bring division in your assignment that God has given you to shut those doors down. You guys know the place... um, it was that little New Age shop in downtown Mason called uh, Sterling something. I don't know. Yeah, there you go. How long has that place been there? Anybody know? Well, how long, how long had it been there? Hadn't been there very long? It's been there ever since I've lived here. I've lived here for two years. And the Lord told me, Every once in a while, while I'm coming to church, it's kind of out of the way. He said, just drive by it and tell it to close. And look at it now. It just closed like last time I checked, it was closed. And I'm like, well, there you go. Like, you just tell the thing that's governing that it's not allowed to govern anymore. And it has to go somewhere else. And then you just, you don't got to send it to the pits of hell. You just got to send it to where it's ineffective. (laughs) Hell is, you can't send it to hell, because hell is reserved for a later time. So when you tell a demon that you're casting it into the pit of hell, you're prophesying about its future, but it's not actually going anywhere yet. You have to tell it to leave its place of power to where it becomes ineffective. Every single deliverance that has ever taken place, that's what happens. If you notice, with the strong man, it says you have to remove it from the house. That, that means the house was the place that it was caused, that it was told to govern, where it had the right to govern before it fell, and then it gets removed, and then you fill the house, so when it comes in, it can't, when it comes back with its seven little friends, bring intimidation, even though probably six of them don't actually have power there because they weren't created to govern it, but he wanted to intimidate you, and so he brought six of his friends, so he could get back in the door, and then they just get to like hang out with him and do stupid stuff, because he's the strong man, right? So then people get all distracted, well, you know, I got an ankle problem, but you know, I'm also thinking of committing suicide, and you go and try to pray against the ankle problem, you know what I'm saying? So... (laughs) You've got to remove the strong man from its position of power and then bring truth in, who is Jesus. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So that thing can't come back in. So when whoever here is assigned to praying against abortion goes around and starts closing down abortion clinics, you better also pray that God's going to replace it with life and life abundantly going to replace it with, with uh, services that provide help for women that are thinking about having abortions. You can't just get rid of it and expect it to go away. You've got to come up with a solution with the Lord. Now, I'm kind of on a roll now. <laughs> I got distracted by the time. Is this good? Is this helpful? How many of you feel like you're called to something and you're just like, I haven't really stepped into it? Tara, can you go ahead and come up? Like, I know God has assigned me to something, 
but I just still have yet to take that first step. Or I know the Lord has given me a calling, and I'm kind of on step three, but I'm just kind of struggling getting past that. Possibly because of disappointment in your life. Anybody? If that's you, go ahead and stand. Because I'm going to pray for you. And I'm going to ask that God releases an impartation of faith, the enemy of disappointment. Holy Spirit, I just ask that you just come right now. Thank you. That you're breaking disappointment. You see, that's this is exactly this is how it robs our faith. You will get disappointed once in something, and then you'll avoid it. So like you could be afraid of flying and you could get on a plane once and then get right back off because you're too scared and then never go flying again because of your disappointment. Well, God (laughs) created us to soar on wings of eagles. So you better get over your fear of flying. I see this mostly with sickness. People will get prayer for sickness a few times. They'll genuinely get disappointed at the altar. And they'll just stop getting prayer. They'll just wait for the word of knowledge to come or something. And they'll rob their own faith. Like that that healing will not come unless your faith partners with it. And if you've already partnered with disappointment, then you are literally combating the very thing that you are wanting breakthrough for. So, Lord, I just break off disappointment right now in the name of Jesus. I declare that, God, you are good and you never disappoint us. Everyone just repeat after me. God, you are good and you are not a disappointment. You will never disappoint me. So I break off that disappointment right now in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you are releasing a gift of faith right now in the name of Jesus. Faith is a spiritual gift. It is an impartation that God releases to you. So Holy Spirit, I ask that you come and just begin to release this faith right now in the name of Jesus. That they would tangibly feel it. That they would begin to get blueprints and ideas of how they are to overcome whatever it is their situation is. Whatever disappointment, distraction, discouragement, doubt, disillusionment, division. God, that you would come and show them their breakthrough. Show them how they are to break through it. Faith is a seed. Jesus said, if you have faith like a mustard seed, you can move mountains. Well, seeds have to break through the ground at some point. (laughs) And if you allow disappointment in your life, you will stop watering. And then you'll question whether you even put a seed in. You'll be like, did I even plant seeds? I don't even remember planting a seed. Well, God planted the seed. (laughs) You've got to water it. So, Lord, I ask that you just remind people of the seeds right now that you've placed in them. The seeds of faith that you've placed in them. And, God, that you would begin to pour out your living water on those seeds right now in the name of Jesus. God, remind them to water every single day. Give them visions of sprinklers. Like, they're going to they're gonna drive down the road and they're going to see someone's sprinklers in their yard. And it's going to remind them, oh, yeah i got to water my faith. (laughs) Every time they wash their hands, every time they see water, God, I ask that every time they see water, you remind them to water their seed of faith until they see it break through the ground. And then once it breaks through the ground, you've gone through the hard part. Everything's easy after that. 
because you can see what God is now doing. For some of you, if it's sickness, if it's fear, if it's shame that you've lost your faith in, God wants you to keep watering it until you see a result. And then after that, the result becomes a testimony and it becomes the spirit of prophecy. And then you can keep speaking prophecy over what it is that you've seen break through the ground. So Lord, I ask that you just pour out faith right now. Pour, that this church would be the most faith-filled church in this region. That neighborhoods would be absolutely dumbfounded and confused and wonder why we have so much faith. Lord, I just bless, I bless this community. I bless these neighborhoods. God, I ask that you just begin to draw them near. Actually, I'm going to take that back. God, I take that prayer back. God, I ask that you send these people to them. I ask that you send these people to prayer walk around their neighborhoods, praying in tongues, breaking off the territorial principalities that are in their neighborhoods, that are causing drug addiction, that are causing child abuse, that are, that are causing sickness and disease in their neighborhood, that are causing all of their neighbors just to look at the ground as they walk by you. That God, you would send people to prayer walk around these places and displace principalities and powers out of their territories so that their neighborhood can see revival. God, I ask that you send them. Send them to the places that they are supposed to take dominion over this earth. Whether it's in government, whether it's in business, whether it's in families, in the medical field. God, I ask that you send them to their places of dominion and reveal to them what is taking place in the second heaven and how they are supposed to respond from the third heaven. 